1942, a general was handed an impossible task. Build something that had never been built before, manage something that had never been managed, and do it all while keeping it secret from 130,000 workers scattered across an entire continent. The engineers said it couldn't be done. The scientists weren't sure if the physics would even work. And yet, in just three years, they constructed the largest industrial complex in human history, bigger than the entire automotive industry of its time. This is the story of the Manhattan Project, but more importantly, it's the story of General Leslie Groves, the man who took the most ambitious engineering challenge ever conceived and turned the impossible into reality. When they told him it couldn't be done, he didn't argue with them. He simply got to work. But here's what makes this story truly extraordinary. The man who would orchestrate the most complex construction project in human history almost never got the chance. Three days before he was supposed to ship out to a combat command in the Pacific, the assignment he'd waited his entire career for, everything changed with a single phone call. Leslie Richard Groves Jr. was born on August 17, 1896 in Albany, New York, to an army chaplain who instilled in his children the core values of strength, bravery, and absolute honesty. From his earliest days, Groves understood that the army was not just a career. It was a calling that demanded everything you had to give. By 1942, Groves had built a reputation as the man you called when the impossible needed to happen on schedule. He had just completed construction of the Pentagon, finishing the world's largest office building in under 18 months, a feat that stunned even his critics. He managed over a million men and spent $8 billion on army construction projects with a peak month expenditure of $720 million, equivalent to building 15 pentagons in 30 days. But on September 17, 1942, at 10.30 in the morning, General Brehan Somerville delivered news that would change everything. Your overseas assignment is cancelled. You have a new mission. What Groves didn't know was that he had just been handed the most important construction project in human history. And the fate of World War II now rested on his ability to build something that most people believed was scientifically impossible. The intriguing truth that would drive Groves for the next three years was this. Success wasn't just about building bombs, it was about constructing an entirely new kind of civilization, a secret industrial empire that operated by rules no one had ever written before. Groves' path to the Manhattan Project began not with nuclear physics, but with concrete and steel. After graduating fourth in his West Point class in 1918, just 10 days before the armistice ended World War I, he chose the Corps of Engineers and spent the next two decades mastering the art of the impossible construction project. His early assignments took him from Hawaii to Nicaragua, where he conducted surveys for the Inter-Oceanic Nicaragua Canal. When the 1931 Nicaraguan earthquake struck, Groves didn't wait for orders. He took control of Managua's water supply system and restored it to working order, earning him the Nicaraguan Presidential Medal of Merit. This wasn't just engineering, it was leadership under pressure that saved thousands of lives. The experience that truly shaped Groves came during the mobilization period before America entered World War II. As the army grew from 135,000 men to an eventual 8 million, Groves oversaw the construction of training camps, munitions plants, airfields, and depots across the entire United States. He learned to coordinate efforts across vast distances, manage enormous budgets, and most critically, get results when failure wasn't an option. But the project that defined him was the Pentagon. When others said it couldn't be built in the time required, Groves didn't argue. He redesigned the entire construction process. He implemented revolutionary management techniques, coordinated multiple contractors simultaneously, and delivered the world's largest office building ahead of schedule and under budget. Those who worked with him described his approach as relentless but effective. He worked six days a week in Washington, then spent Sundays visiting whichever project needed his personal attention most. This was the man who, on September 18, 1942, just one day after taking command of the Manhattan Project, purchased 1,250 tons of high-quality uranium ore from the Belgian Congo and approved Oak Ridge, Tennessee, as the site for the secret uranium enrichment facility. By September 23rd, he had been promoted to Brigadier General. The speed wasn't reckless. It was calculated precision from a man who understood that in wartime, every day of delay could cost lives. The Manhattan Project challenged every traditional concept of how large-scale engineering worked. Previous construction projects, no matter how massive, operated under known principles with tested materials and proven techniques. 
Groves was being asked to build industrial facilities for processes that existed only in theory, using materials that had never been produced in quantity to create weapons that no one was certain would function. The scale defied comprehension. The K-25 gaseous diffusion plant at Oak Ridge became the world's largest building when it opened in 1944, spanning over 5.2 million square feet, with a volume of 97.5 million cubic feet. At the height of construction, over 25,000 workers labored on this single facility, but K-25 was just one piece of a vast puzzle that included Oak Ridge's uranium enrichment facilities, Hanford's plutonium production reactors, and Los Alamos's weapons development laboratory. What made Groves' achievement revolutionary was his understanding that this wasn't just an engineering problem, it was a management revolution. He had to coordinate efforts across three main sites, plus dozens of supporting facilities throughout the United States, United Kingdom, and Canada. He managed not just construction workers and engineers, but some of the world's most brilliant scientists, each with their own ideas about how the project should proceed. Traditional military hierarchy couldn't handle the complexity. Scientists don't take orders the same way soldiers do, and Groves realized he needed to adapt his leadership style without compromising his ultimate authority. When he selected J. Robert Oppenheimer to lead Los Alamos, despite the physicists' communist associations, Groves took personal responsibility to override FBI objections. He understood that getting the right person in the right position mattered more than following standard security protocols. The project operated under levels of secrecy that had never been attempted. Most of the 130,000 workers had no idea what they were building. Information was compartmentalized so thoroughly that scientists working on one aspect of the bomb often didn't know how their work connected to the larger project. Groves created a system where only he and a handful of others understood the complete picture. Groves's solutions to the Manhattan Project's challenges established principles that would reshape how America approached large-scale technological projects for the rest of the 20th century. His first insight was that unprecedented problems required unprecedented management structures. When traditional chain-of-command structures proved inadequate for coordinating scientific research with industrial production, Groves created parallel management systems. Scientists reported through scientific channels, engineers through engineering hierarchies, and construction managers through construction organizations, but all ultimately answered to him. This wasn't bureaucracy, it was controlled complexity that allowed different types of expertise to operate according to their own best practices while maintaining unified direction. His approach to the unknown was equally revolutionary. Rather than wait for scientists to perfect their theories, Groves ordered the construction of multiple facilities based on different approaches to the same problem. Oak Ridge pursued uranium enrichment through three different methods simultaneously, electromagnetic separation, gaseous diffusion and thermal diffusion. This redundancy cost millions, but guaranteed that at least one method would succeed. When scientists at Los Alamos discovered that their original gun-type design wouldn't work with plutonium, potentially wasting the entire Hanford plutonium production program, Groves didn't panic. Instead, he authorized an intensive development program that led to the invention of the implosion design, a far more sophisticated approach that required precision manufacturing at levels never before attempted. The scale of his resource mobilization was staggering. The Manhattan Project consumed materials and manpower comparable to the entire automotive industry. At its peak, it employed 130,000 people and cost $2.2 billion, equivalent to nearly $30 billion today. But these weren't just numbers. They represented Grove's understanding that this project was more important than normal wartime economics. His security innovations were equally groundbreaking. The compartmentalization system he developed became the model for classified programs throughout the Cold War. Workers were told only what they needed to know to perform their specific tasks, and information flowed upward through carefully controlled channels. Most remarkably, he maintained this security across a continent-spanning operation without significantly slowing progress. Groves' methods, while effective, came with costs that extended far beyond dollars and materials. His management style was notoriously demanding and often brutal. Those who worked with him described him as arrogant, ruthless, and utterly insensitive to personal concerns. 
he demanded perfection from subordinates while showing little patience for human limitations or emotional needs. The human cost of his approach was real and significant. Families in Oak Ridge were given just two weeks' notice to abandon farms that had been their homes for generations. Construction proceeded with little regard for worker safety, and the health effects of radiation exposure were poorly understood and inadequately communicated. The compartmentalization that made the project secure also meant that many workers felt disconnected from any meaningful purpose, laboring on mysterious tasks without understanding their contribution to the war effort. His selection of personnel sometimes prioritized capability over character. His decision to employ J. Robert Oppenheimer, despite security concerns, proved successful for the project, but it established precedents for overlooking background issues when talent was deemed essential. Similarly, the project employed scientists who had fled Nazi Germany, bringing invaluable expertise, but also creating complex questions about loyalty and security that would persist long after the war. But perhaps the most troubling aspect of Groves' leadership was his willingness to sacrifice transparency for efficiency. Workers at Oak Ridge handled radioactive materials without fully understanding the risks. Entire communities were displaced without explanation. The democratic principles that America was fighting to defend were temporarily suspended in service of military necessity. This created a dangerous precedent that national security could justify almost any action, no matter how it violated individual rights or community bonds. The environmental consequences of Grove's rush to production became apparent only decades later. The Hanford site in Washington and Oak Ridge in Tennessee required massive cleanup efforts that continue today, costing billions of dollars and affecting local communities for generations. His focus on immediate results gave insufficient consideration to long-term consequences. Rivers were contaminated, soil was poisoned, and workers were exposed to radiation levels that would be considered criminal today. From a moral standpoint, Groves created the industrial infrastructure for weapons that would fundamentally change warfare and international relations. The bombs his project produced killed over 200,000 people in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, ending World War II but ushering in the atomic age and the Cold War arms race. Whether this represents necessary pragmatism or the beginning of humanity's most dangerous era remains a subject of intense debate. Compared to other military leaders of World War II, Groves operated in a unique moral landscape. Combat generals like Patton or MacArthur faced immediate tactical decisions with clear military objectives. Groves was constructing the means to unprecedented destruction while having no direct control over how those means would be employed. His responsibility was to make the weapons possible. Others would decide whether to use them. This separation of creation from deployment allowed him to focus purely on technical success while remaining largely insulated from moral consequences, a luxury that few military leaders in history have enjoyed. On July 16, 1945, at 5.29 in the morning, Leslie Grove stood in a bunker in the New Mexico desert and watched the first nuclear weapon detonate. The Trinity test produced a fireball 2,000 feet in diameter and released energy equivalent to 21,000 tons of TNT. In that moment, the impossible became reality and the world changed forever. But here's what makes Groves' achievement truly remarkable. It wasn't just about the bomb. In three years, he had created something that had never existed before, a new model for how democratic societies could mobilize their resources for technological challenges that seemed beyond human capability. The Manhattan Project became the template for America's space program, medical research initiatives, and technological development programs throughout the Cold War and beyond. The man who had been denied his desired combat command had fought and won a different kind of war. While other generals commanded armies in battle, Groves commanded an army of scientists, engineers and workers in a struggle against the limits of human knowledge and industrial capability. His victory was measured not in territory captured or enemies defeated, but in the transformation of theoretical physics into industrial reality. When Groves retired from the army in 1948, he left behind more than just nuclear weapons. He had proven that American industrial democracy could tackle problems that totalitarian regimes couldn't solve, even with unlimited resources and ruthless methods. The Soviet Union, despite capturing German scientists and stealing American secrets, didn't test their first nuclear weapon until 1949, 
four years after Trinity. The irony of Groves' career is that his greatest success made him largely obsolete. The atomic age he helped create required different kinds of leadership, and his direct uncompromising style was less suited to the diplomatic complexities of nuclear diplomacy. General Dwight Eisenhower, who would become president, made it clear that Groves would never receive the army positions he wanted. Three days after their meeting, Groves announced his intention to retire. Today, as we face new technological challenges that seem impossible, climate change, space exploration, artificial intelligence, biotechnology, we can still learn from Groves' approach. He understood that impossible projects require impossible standards, that breakthrough achievements demand breakthrough management, and that sometimes the most important victories happen not on battlefields, but in laboratories and construction sites where dedicated people refuse to accept that something can't be done. The engineers said it couldn't be done. They were wrong. But they were wrong because one man understood that impossible is not a fact. It's just the starting point for the conversation. Leslie Groves took that conversation and turned it into the most important construction project in human history. In doing so, he didn't just build weapons, he built the future, one impossible day at a time. The Manhattan Project's legacy extends far beyond nuclear weapons. It established the National Laboratory System that continues to drive American scientific research today. It proved that focused government investment in research and development could achieve technological breakthroughs that change the world. And it demonstrated that when freedom and democracy face existential threats, they can mobilize resources and capabilities that surpass what any totalitarian system can achieve. That may be Groves' most important lesson, that the impossible becomes possible not through wishful thinking or gradual progress, but through the focused application of human determination, industrial capability, and organizational genius. When they said it couldn't be done, he didn't waste time arguing. He simply got to work building something bigger than anything the world had ever seen. Thank you.